Hi, everyone. I hope you've been enjoying today's sessions. I understand there were some technical difficulties with two of our live panels during the 1230 session. Those have been addressed, and I want to assure you that, as with all of our annual meeting sessions, you can go to the agenda page and watch these panels in their entirety at your convenience. So I'm so pleased to welcome you to this keynote conversation with the recipient of the 2021 Goler T. Butcher Medal. This medal has been awarded since 1997 to distinguished person of American or other nationality for outstanding contributions to the development or effective realization of international human rights. Upon the recommendation of the Honors Committee, the Executive Council has selected the Honorable Louise Arbour to receive this year's medal. The committee's citation states, and I quote, during her distinguished career, Louise Arbour has been a sustained and powerful voice for a more compassionate and just world. She has been a force for human rights and the promotion of accountability, both at the national level as law professor, judge on the courts of Ontario, and justice on the Supreme Court of Canada, and internationally as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunals, for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, UN Special Representative for International Migration, and as a leader in civil society, end quote. Throughout her career, Madame Arbour has been a tireless force for the promotion of human rights. The American Society of International Law is honored to present the 2021 Goler T. Butcher Medal to Louise Arbour. I'm just so glad you could be with us and you are a personal hero. Just wanted to say congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. And I have to say, this is a great honor. And when I looked at the list of uh, uh, previous recipients of this wonderful medal, I saw the names of many, many old friends. I just wish we could all be together to celebrate, particularly over a glass of wine, but that's another. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm very honored and very Thank happy you. to join Monica. Absolutely. And our moderator this afternoon is very well known to us, of course, Monica Pinto, Professor Emirata at the University of Buenos Aires School of Law and an incoming counselor of the society. She is a past recipient of the Butcher Medal herself and also the 2019 recipient of the Honorary Member Award. Welcome, Monica. Always a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you so much for having me in this conversation uh, with the, the recipient of the Goller T. Butcher Medal for this year. Dear Louis, so nice to be accompanying you this evening, really, well, evening here, afternoon in, in, in this seat. So nice, so nice, so well-deserved. Uh, and I'm so pleased we, we will have uh, some minutes to, to have a conversation. When I was preparing this, uh, this activity, I was thinking that you and me, we met when, when you were the High Commissioner on Human Rights uh, for the UN in, in 2006, you started. And, and that was a time of great changes. That was a time in which the, the Commission on Human Rights just closed out and, and a new baby was born, the Human Rights Council. That was the time of the negotiations on the scope and on the dynamics of the Universal Periodical Review, the UPR. That was a time in which a new High Commissioner would file an amicus curiae to a high national court and even to an international court. So I, I, I would really like you to share with us your views about this institutional framework of human rights at the time you were there and even today, if you have fresh looks on that. Well, thank you. This actually, it's really fun for the two of us to have this conversation because it allows me the indulgence of going back and having a little bit of historical perspective, which it's harder to do. Uh, there's so much on our plate, contemporary issues that we often don't take the time to look back on where this was. I, I have to say though, that I consider myself very much a, a kind of accidental tourist in the field of 
international law. This was not my main uh, first uh, uh, career occupation. I, I was mostly a criminal lawyer uh, and then a judge, but criminal law was my main discipline. And it's really through the tribunals, this, ex, this very forced marriage between international law and criminal law that I actually, I think, discovered the wealth, uh, the richness of institutions and organizations. So when I arrived at OHCHR, it actually took me a couple of weeks just to pronounce the uh, yeah. <laughs> name of my own office. I kept calling it UNHCR, which was better <laughs> known. Um, it was actually, as you said, at a time of great change. This was a still a relatively new organization within the UN system. And not surprisingly, if you pause to think about it, it was the subject of considerable criticism. Uh, the Commission on Human Rights, I think, was under constant uh, challenge by member states. Uh, at, maybe less so at the time, but certainly with a little bit of distance, I have become convinced that, as the saying goes, it's a big bit like dogs dancing. We shouldn't be commenting on or how well they're dancing, just realize it's a miracle they're dancing at all. Uh, when I look at any kind of effort uh, to advance, uh, to protect, to promote international law in an international, uh, uh, human rights law in an international context, when you consider what an intrusion it is on state sovereignty penetrating this very politically intimate relationship between essentially a government and its own people. And by own people, I include not just citizens, but everybody falling within its jurisdiction. It's not surprising that there's a lot of pushback. So the commission was under a lot of pressure, particularly if I recall, the main criticism was the claim of double standards, the pretty obvious dominance of Western um, the, the Western ownership, let's put it this way, of the international human rights agenda, and in particular on the question of country mandates, of the singling out of some that were perceived to be those who didn't have enough friends to be able to push back against this kind of ganging up against them. That was the atmosphere. So when talk, you know, member states started talking about reforming the commission and transforming it into the Human Rights Council, they were originally, in terms of institutional framework, my recollection, they were basically two points of view. One was led uh, at that time by the US, in particular by then Ambassador John Bolton, who I think wanted to create a, a kind of a, a Human Rights Council that would look a little bit like the Security Council, but of course with no power. But so a small, as I used to call it, obviously not with a great deal of admiration for the idea, a kind of self-appointed club of the self-declared virtuous. Small group, only the good guys. And you recall in those days, any time that say the ambassador of Libya would take the chair of the council, there was an outcry. So at the other extreme, I was arguing that one of the features of human rights was universality, and therefore the body should have universal membership. That became pretty clearly unmanageable. I mean, you couldn't have a subsidiary body of the General Assembly that was constituted by the whole of the General Assembly. But so this, I, the idea of universality, I certainly was looking for how can we enforce that, maybe move away from country mandates, but at the same time, remain focused on where the most serious violations of human rights are taking place. And that's where I think the idea of the universal periodic review uh, came up, that even if we are to keep uh, focus on some countries, everybody has to be uh, made to account and starting with the members of the council themselves. So I think all this came out, out of a concern uh, to push back on the claim of double standards and try to, uh, yeah, to, to make sure that nobody escaped the kind of scrutiny that they were so keen to put others under. I don't think it's gone away. The, the claim of double standards has uh, been there for a long time, but 
But and the, but the irony also of after the U.S. pushed back so much to get a smaller uh, human rights council from the Commission, they got it a little, tiny bit smaller, and the the Seven. seats that they lost were the Western seats. It was a kind of poetic justice, I thought, for a bad idea. Yeah, but but you remember that at that time the UPR was teamed to just pass over the the uh, the thematic mandates, the country mandates, and so forth. And at the end of the day, we could keep those mandates. And and even today, we have a high number of of a special procedures. Uh, as as I checked this morning, we are having forty four. Uh, thematic procedures, and we are having 12 country mandates. And as I had my country mandate myself, I do remember that we had to pass an exam every year. And every time we went to the commission, there were pressures to say, okay, this is the last time you have to close, and you have the friends of the country on the one side and on the other. And, uh, and at the end of the day, that also happened during your mandate, the, the equation was, okay, you're a nice guy, okay, we are offering you technical cooperation. You are a bad guy, guy we are keeping you on the, on the blacklist. But during your mandate, technical cooperation became something more universal too. And, and there, there were many uh, efforts deployed at that time for technical cooperation to reach uh, uh, many countries to prepare UPR and, and to be prepared for other for other steps that had to be taken uh, to be in the commission or in the council at that time. Well, actually, it's interesting you mentioned that because I recall in particular one set of negotiations as to whether or not Nepal would be the subject of a of a country of a special procedure country mandate, which of course was always a a sign of you know having fallen from grace and so on. So as part of my another agenda I had from my office, which was to bring OHCHR into the field in which we were extremely absent compared to other UN organizations, we negotiated for Nepal that rather than appoint a special rapporteur on Nepal, the government, I signed an agreement with the government, they would allow me to open an OHHR office in Nepal. The only thing we hadn't put in this agreement was how big, how big an office. And by the time the financing came up to support it, it ended up being by far the largest OHHR, OHHR presence from anywhere, bigger, bigger than the office we had in Colombia, which used to be a big, large one, Cambodia, yes. Nepal was, we had an immensely large uh, field capacity. And that led me, uh, in fact, to this other concern I had was that the, the Human Rights Council and all the state uh, created mechanisms were very demanding, but they were basically occupying us essentially full time. And I thought, well, seriously, look at me. I'm supposed to be the High Commissioner for Human Rights and all I'm doing is I'm servicing duty bearers in their alleged effort to protect right holders. What's wrong with this picture? Why is it that we are 90% of what we could do is to be secretarial support? That's not true, it's not 90%, but it was a huge proportion. And in, in uh, comparison to that, in uh, DPKO peacekeeping missions, they would at that time hire a few, sometimes one or two human rights advisors. And the role of the office of the high commissioner was simply almost as a recruitment agency to look at CVs and propose candidates. And after DPKO would place someone in the Congo or in Iraq, we were supposed to have no further contact or, so again, this made no sense to me. And, we negotiated very strongly with DPKO, so they would be a dual reporting line and all the substantive backup would come from the UN human rights system, not from operations in peacekeeping. So getting OHHR into the field was a small obsession of mine. I thought we were otherwise. So, you know, Geneva, right? Not <laughs> a place. You know, skiing on the weekend and hiking in the mountains. The Very far from the countries where problems arise. Yeah, you had you, you to be there. 
And we have to be there also to be a credible partner to other UN agencies like UNICEF or WHO or the World Food Program. They're out there. And we were seen at times as merely pontificating in the abstract about rights, of the rights of IDPs and so on, having never set foot in a camp. But anyway, so this was, I still believe that this, this decentralization of, of, of the work is, is critical. And then you mentioned amicus. This is, um, this is also very interesting. Uh, just, be, just before I became the High Commissioner, I was on the Supreme Court of Canada. And uh, I think two things struck me at that time. First, we had at least one case, but possibly more, where High Commissioner for Refugees intervened. This was at a time where the Supreme Court of Canada was becoming very welcoming to interveners. Um, I, for a long time, this was not the case, but in my days, the court welcomed the contributions of experts from civil society and so on. And this brief by UNHCR I thought was so useful, you know, just to give us credible access to international instruments. In the human rights system, uh, in Canada, human rights litigation was very strong. I mean, we had a recently adopted Charter of Rights and Freedoms, constitutionally entrenched. I'd never heard of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And I had one case in particular in which I wrote a dissenting opinion uh, on economic and social rights. And it's only when I left the Supreme Court of Canada and arrived in Geneva, I realized there was a whole world who thought the same way I did. Where were they when I needed them on the court trying to put together my opinion? And I told them, you are so arcane and obscure, particularly the treaty body system, uh, but amicus became another avenue in which I thought the High Commissioner for Human Rights should be present in national courts, in regional bodies and so on, um, advocating for the, the proper articulation and application of norms. And um, this was not easy to do even within the, U the UN system, which is often the case. The hardest thing to do are often the things, your worst enemies are inside the house. But so it took a certain amount of persuasion with OLA, the Office of Legal Affairs and so on. But eventually we started very modestly intervening first. I think my very first one was in the Sierra Leone uh, special court. I figured if we intervene in an international type uh, body, it won't be. And then we intervened um, in the US Supreme Court, uh, in, the, in Iraq against the death penalty in Cambodia. Anyway, I thought this was another avenue that uh, really had to be explored. And then I'll just mention my, when I thought I was being very subtle in trying to unify the treaty body system, I thought I was being very subtle because to me, this was a, a modest step towards eventually possibly an international human rights court. But I never mentioned that. I thought if I could just at least get these treaty bodies to all come like in one big house where there's one front door and then you can have your specialties, but the resistance from inside, particularly from the members of the treaty body system, from many in my office, let alone member states who I thought were not being fooled quite so easily was monumental. And of course it was a total failure. I still think, you know, you can't win every battle, especially these institutional reform battles. Yeah, you lose a few. That's life, but you you won you won many battles. I I cannot I cannot avoid uh, telling you that today it's forty five years we had the the last uh, coup d'état in my country, the last military dictatorship, and uh, and it was you as high commissioner who proposed to the to the uh, commission on human rights to study and to bless a right to the truth a right of the whole society to know what had happened, who had participated and what they had done with the victims. And I think that right to the truth that now makes part of positive international human rights law owes you a, a lot, but uh, it is really a landmark, a landmark that in, 
in countries, in many countries in the world, wherever you have transitional justice working, well, the right to the truth is important. So I just want uh, some reflection uh, from you on, on what you had in mind when you thought that, uh, in fact, you had to propose that right to the truth. That was immediately after you, you took office, and that was in 2006. I do remember very well. I wonder, Monica, if it had not started before, before I got, I'm sure, I, certainly I didn't invent it. I, um, no, no, of course. There were Joanet <laughs> and Sheriff yes. Vassiuni and others working on the principles, of course. Yes, yeah, I think it was brewing. Certainly having come from war crimes prosecutions, you know, from the very pioneering work of ICTY and ICTR, the two tribunals, um, and, um, you know, when these tribunals were starting, the whole coming together of, on the one hand, international humanitarian law and transitional justice, this was all coming together. And I think it was very apparent to me, uh, particularly, you know, working directly with victims and with association of victims and so on, the, the need to, first of all, to know and for the world to know, and it didn't have to be the whole world, but the community, the country to know was almost as important, uh, I was going to say almost more important, but I'm not sure, as uh, the idea of punishment and accountability and so on. And frankly, well, maybe two things come to mind um, on this subject. The, the first one is, in recent years, how far we've moved from any idea of the value of truth. Um, I know historians and journalists and lawyers have different standards of uh, what tools we use to reconstruct historical facts, uh, but we all have at least a common serious journalist and academics and, and so on. We, we all have at least a desire to pursue with all the tools at our disposal the, a credible reconstruction of what happened, something that is credible to, to victims, the community. And so even if it doesn't lead to any other form of, of accountability and punishment, either because it's too late, and, and I think it's a very, very profound human need um, to, yeah, to have access to, to the truth. And this, the second thing is, I think if there's something that the international human rights world does well, it's norm setting, mm -hmm. norms and standards and articulating, refining the expression of norms and principles. Not so good at implementing, not surprisingly, because of all the barriers of state sovereignty and politics and so on, but to inform uh, national courts, regional courts, national courts, national courts. <laughs> Uh, I think this is one of the greatest contribution, actually. It looks very intangible, but I think it's, the, it's maybe the highlight of what the international uh, human rights system can do. It's this sophisticated articulation of norm, and I think the right to truth is one of them. The danger, I think, is to become addicted to this mm -hmm. activity of norm refining, and um, you mentioned the multiplication of special procedures. Uh, like you, I looked to see where this was at. And I have to say, I find some slightly esoteric. And I worry that this becomes a distraction. It's a very convenient way of obscuring important things by agitating over lots of other things that are not so critical or are very abstract or are, in a sense, a duplication, another way of of uh, pursuing the same kind of ideas, but the right to truth, I think, and the events that you've referred to, certainly in Canada, it's, I think it, this is what propelled um, these uh, truth and reconciliation commissions with regard to the treatment of indigenous peoples. Um, you know, you always like to think that you've invented everything nationally, but the reality is I think a lot of that came from the impulse that there was in transitional justice movements, in the, the visibility of international humanitarian law after the tribunals and the uh, International Criminal Court, all these things I think carried 
uh, these ideas and truth commissions uh, became that. And I think that at the end of the day, uh, you you brought me to the to the field of uh, international criminal law and international criminal court. And and in fact, on the one side, you have the the need for justice to be done, and that's the role that are played by the prosecutors, by the defense lawyers, by the judges. But on the other side, you have those victims that are looking for satisfaction and the development of the, the proceedings themselves and, and the way in which they are recognized is a satisfaction for them. So Charles, we have two more minutes, uh, just a tiny reflection on how uh, you, 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 you think uh, the work of law of the, the, the legal community can bring satisfaction to the victims. Well, I think in many areas, we're still searching for how justice can, is best delivered. Um, I think in many uh, areas, we find in the criminal justice system, for instance, um, there's an old English case, and every time I want to cite it, I forget what it's called, it's called Pierce and Pierce or something. And there's a quote in there that I always found quite inspiring. It says, basically it says, Everything, even very good things, like peace and justice and truth, can be pursued with, with too much zeal and can be obtained at too high a cost. And I think that the post-9-11 kind of obsession with the repression of terrorism brought us exactly there, that they are certain things um, things that seem to be good things on, on the face of it, like justice, like truth, like peace itself, can be pursued. You know, obtaining truth by torture is too high a cost. Obtaining peace by completely surrendering to a dictatorship is too high a cost. I think sometimes when you're young, you think in in absolutes, this is more a centrist view of truth and justice. But I, I and I worry sometimes that the human rights agenda is perceived by some as having come become a very rigid ideology. Um, I hope that this idea that that we need to find balance that they are good things that could be pursued inappropriately, and that's not it's not good for the victims. It's not good for the system. Um, and it's very dangerous, of course, for um, a corruption of the entire exercise. Louise, thank you so much. Thanks a lot. It has been my pleasure to accompany you today. It was Catherine, wonderful to talk to you. Over to you. <laughs> thank you both so much. What an incredibly nuanced and sophisticated treatment of these, of these topics. It's been such a pleasure to have you both and to be able to listen in, like a fly on the wall to this conversation. So thank you, Louise, congratulations again. It's been our privilege. Um, to everyone else, thank you for joining us. This is the end of the first day of substantive sessions. Of course, uh, we'll ask you to, to join. There's a wealth of interest group meetings, professional development sessions, sponsored uh, programs that will continue well into the evening. So we uh, also suggest that you use this time to engage. Uh, there are a lot of technical ways for you to reach out less formally to this your network uh, at ASO, and we, we highly encourage you to do that. You'll find all the links to these sessions on the agenda page. Thanks very much, everyone. Always a pleasure. Thank you.